Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. Uh, there have been so many questions about Desert Brutality 2020, not only in terms of the rules and divisions and general match design principles, but just other stuff as well, that I'm here with Sinister Rifleman, also known as Russell Fagan, depends on whichever order you prefer. Uh, and uh, we're going to answer a bunch of these questions, and hopefully this will help you understand what Desert Brutality is about, and help you design your kit, and have the best match that you can. So, I've broken this up into sections, including divisions and other stuff, including at the end, Probably your favorite part, we have one about fun, weird, or personal. Mm. Yeah. But anyways, let's start off with PCC, because this came up a lot. All right. So there's three questions. I'll ask them all, and then we can answer them. So, so First, some backstory. The, yeah. At the 2019 match, mm -hmm. we allowed PCCs because at the last minute we found out that you couldn't shoot past 100 yards right. at that range. It's true. And, and battle rifle cartridges were prohibited. So the trade-off was, hey, if people want to use PCCs, they could. I think we had two or three people out of 176 do it. Wasn't a lot. But that said, we have set a precedent in that regard, and the standard two-gun action challenge match in Tucson typically allows them. So, these are good questions, right? So James asks, are 9mm PCCs allowed? Angus asks, if I was freakishly lucky enough to own an NFA full-auto submachine gun from World War II, what classic division would it be? Is there a PCC category? And Brandon asks, I hear everyone talking about pistol caliber carbines. Can PCCs be shot in place of a rifle? And can they still be in a pistol or brace form? Well, that's a lot of questions, but I think we can answer all the same way. All right. So we are allowing PCCs across all divisions with the caveat that this range allows us to shoot out to 250 yards. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will have spinner targets at 100 yards. So do you feel your PCC is capable of making those shots and rotating a spinner? That's a question for you to answer. Personally, I'm going to use a regular 5.56 <laughs> gun when I'm doing my Armored Plus P run. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with PCCs is they are generally not as accurate as even an iron sight AK. The grouping of a PCC, the best ones I get at 50 yards, are about double that of my 5.56 rifle. Yep. And, you know, at least 50% bigger than um, an AK. And the standard for stage design we have is using an iron sight AK to complete the stages. Yep. So I've always said that. All the two-gun stuff, right? Every stage should be completable. Not winnable, but finishable with an iron-sided AK. That's like the litmus test. Right. So, yes, you can use your PCC. Is it competitive? To be determined. Uh, is it a good idea? To be determined. Uh, maybe someone will come out with a PCC that's really uh, dialed in and smoke everyone with it, but I tend to believe that a skilled regular rifle shooter would beat a skilled PCC shooter. That said, it's not all doom and gloom if you want to use a PCC. So here's how this is going to work. If you want to bring a PCC, you still have to have a sidearm. This is not going to be a match where you can use the PCC always in lieu of or instead of your pistol because there will be stages and requirements at this match where pistols are required for certain courses of fire, even certain stages. However, the PCC will definitely have a disadvantage at 250 yards, as you've described, mm -hmm. but there will probably be moments and stages where you will have an option if you're using a PCC to use your PCC or your pistol, but there will also be times where you have to use your pistol. So, in answering this, all divisions allow PCC. If you happen to have an NFA full auto submachine gun from World War II, bring it, but also bring a pistol because the stages are going to require you to have a sidearm as well as your long arm, and the PCC will be your long arm. You're not going to have two things. You're not going to have a rifle, a submachine gun, and a pistol. If you bring a submachine gun, that's your primary long arm, and you have a pistol to complement it. And to address which division the World War II subgun would be in, that would be in Classic Auto. Correct. So, yep. Uh, and as far as braces go, um, pistol calibers will be shot at pistol targets or PCC targets. Rifle calibers will be shot at rifle targets. What the exact configuration of the gun you're using is, is between you and the federal government. Unless you're competing in retro or classic, which we've already ruled that braces are not allowed in those divisions because they did not exist. No, there weren't pistol braces in World War II. Right. Not, well, there was stocked pistols, but that's an NFA thing entirely again, isn't it? Right. So, sorry, like retro XM177 uh, clone, you can't put a brace on that and use that in retro. Now, Mario, I can already see the question. In, in, in classic auto, someone's going to say, and no one's going to do this. The questions that get asked and the reality of what people do at the match are like two different things. Right. But someone's going to say, well, if I have a legal stocked broom handle Mauser, can it be my rifle with the stock and a pistol without it? I would say, yeah, go for it, but you're going to have a hard time. <laughs> Let's go to retro. Uh, Joe L. We've heard Ian's thoughts on the ideal setup for classic. What would you consider the ideal setup to be for retro? Now, we should clarify, retro, there's retro light and retro heavy. All right, so retro being 1946 to 1986. Um, Essentially the Cold War. Right. 
If I was competing in retro light this year, I would use my 723 style build, which is a 14 and a half inch uh, carry handle upper uh, AR mm -hmm. with the Brownells uh, uh, repro scope. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and a Sig 226 is my handgun. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm, I'm similar, but a little different. I think my goal with that would be is I would go with my trusty old SP1 because I like that. I would still have the Brownells retro scope on it because you can still get to the irons, and their retro scope is really pretty rad. This is not a placement for their scope; it's just a good scope. And then for my pistol, I think I'd go with a Beretta. Yeah. But yeah. Any any double stack nine millimeter DASA gun. Now, if I could get one, I'd use a Gen One Glock 17. But they are incredibly rare at this point because yeah. the Glock had that trade-in program where everyone upgraded their Gen ones into later Gen threes. So. What would you do for retro heavy? Retro heavy. I mean, there's your argument between an M14, an FAL, or a G3, and they're all kind of like bad in their own way. They're all toxic, so, yeah. So from a match perspective, if you had a dialed-in FAL yeah. that was uh, shooting very mild, that might be a good option. And mm -hmm. the low bore offset on the sights could be handy on some of the stage designs. But uh, maybe your uh, BRN10. Yeah, that would be a good answer. That would be good. BRN10, or for myself... I actually would be, and this is one that most people don't have access to, I would think about if I was going retro heavy, which I am not, um, my SVD or NDM86 would be pretty interesting too. But, yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. And we actually already answered Darren B. What would be your choice of pistol if using retro? You said the SIG, I said the Beretta. Right, I actually used the SIG 226 uh, last year when uh, Classic was effectively retro division as it is today. So um, I really liked using the SIG 226 uh, because it is a... DASA gun that the decocker only does one thing. Yeah, fair. You know, I think it's really interesting that the reason, when you see this, there's some consternation about the rules because we change them every year. But the reason we do that is because every year we want the match to be fresh, different, and a unique approach. And the range provides different opportunities. Like right. at this range, we're out at 250 yards, we're allowed full auto, we're allowed 308. Last year we didn't have that. Right. So, um, Arturo C. Other than holsters, are there any rules or restrictions regarding gear? Slings, pouches, belts, vests, etc. For retro, I'll get on this first. So, uh, no, there aren't. This is not so. People, I think there's a couple things that happen here. Um, with Desert Brutality, we encourage and have divisions that allow people to do cool stuff with old guns, M1 Garands, 1903 Springfields, AR10s. That does not necessarily mean that it's a cosplay division. Like you can, you're using the old gear and the old guns, but the rest of that, if you want to go in period dress and period gear, cool. Absolutely love it. That's awesome. But there's no requirement to do that. That's something that's different. This is more about the gear, or excuse me, the guns, and competing with the guns. If you want to take it a step further and have to have, like, the right sling and the right pouch, you're welcome to, but the rules don't require that. So if you wanted to do something anachronistic and run an M1 Garand but use Molly pouches, we don't care. Yeah, any sort of modern equipment as far as pouches, slings, etc. is totally fine. Um, but, you know, there is that role-playing aspect to it. We have Derp Group Alpha is coming as a, a whole unit of Grenada uh, U.S. forces for yeah. the event. So um, it's cool. It's neat that people do that, and, and it gives people a chance to kind of do that uh, mill serp collecting every year as they rotate through different eras of equipment. Oh, I don't want to discourage that at all. It's just right. there's nothing in the rules that require it. So, and it's also, to me, it's interesting. I, I think testing the original gear is really interesting, and I think that's compelling. But at the same time, it's really also interesting to see how well can these guns do on the clock against modern competitors? And we don't necessarily have to futz with these garbage pieces of auxiliary gear. Like, that, I have lost matches at two gun with a cool old gun where the old gun was doing great, but the damn pouch that the mag was in cost me the stage. Like, right. that's uh, ugh. Henry C. What, are the, what is the rationale for prohibiting an ambidextrous safety in retro division? They didn't exist, as to the best of my knowledge. Yep. I looked at uh, the C7s as issued by Canada, did start incorporating ambidextrous features, but to the best of my knowledge, they did not start incorporating them until after 86. This is one of those challenges. So when we say things like 1946 to 1986, right, that's the date? So mm -hmm. the, um, I have to remember that in my own brain, but the this is becomes, it really is interesting because people start asking questions, you're like, well, did they? And some of the questions we've been asked, you start researching, you're like, huh. Didn't know that. Other questions were like, no, they didn't do that. So when you have these lines set, you have to kind of stick to them, or what is it? Right. right. And then things like the Norgan Ambicatch, which was the quintessential AR Ambicatch, was not patented until 1995. Yeah. So, um, and that recently expired. But 
a lot of those features just weren't on service rifles or, or even commercially available in, in aftermarket parts. Samuel K., what is the reason behind the no rails rule on retro and classic rifles? So this means we can't have M lock or Picatinny or anything on a gun that's in classic or retro. Um, I'll speak to this and then maybe you can add to it too. The initial thought behind this was that if there's rails on it, there's other modernization going on with the gun and it was an easy way to de delineate between a rifle that should be compatible with classic and retro or not. Um, so there are some exceptions, right? And one of the things that we've been able to do is if you happen to, there's one guy, I think he's coming from Europe, right? that he's going to be using a G3 that's otherwise not modified in any way, but it has a piece of pick rail welded to the top. And he submitted an email to us, and we've issued a, uh, a, a what would you call exemption. It? exemption clause for him. And if you have something that you feel falls into the exemption, contact us, match coordinator at inrange.tv with a picture of it, and we'll tell you if it's okay or not. But the general catch-all rule for no rails, even if they're not being used, is one, Someone could accidentally use it, and that would be inappropriate for the rules. But two, it generally made a nice defined line between what is truly classic retro and what isn't. Yeah, and, and the line blurs between what is modern and retro equipment, unless we have hard and fast rules like that, like no pick rails on a rifle or no light rail on a handgun, where does it end? Um, you know, I actually had some people email me, okay, can I use my Glock 19 Gen 4 because it's a, equivalent to whatever and it's like no it wasn't a period gun there's other things that have changed and we want to still encourage people to use uh, period DASA guns and single action guns and handguns in particular where if it was oh like any striker fired modern gun that had a variant that existed before then was the case then no one would be using it they'd all be using gen 3 or to 5 glocks yeah so we have to have those hard and fast rules to encourage actual period use and we want the people who are deliberately seeking out period equipment and building period guns to uh, not feel like they're in some way being uh, shorthanded by us, by them going out of the way to do that, and then someone else just kind of like they doing it half They half waltz in with yeah. their thingamajig that right. doesn't fit. Yeah. Right. So it, it really is a division for the dedicated fans of in-range that are into historical or retro equipment. Yeah, I actually thought classic and retro was good. It, the whole match is full, as probably all of you know, but... Um, armored and well, armored filled up relatively quick. So the scout division is what took the dominance immediately, mm -hmm. and I was like, I was kind of surprised because we always hear a lot of comments about classic rifles on in range because of our of our work and our video, our body of work. But really, classic was the smallest division and the sl slowest one to fill. Yep. Everybody wants to do classic gangsta stuff until it's time to do classic gangsta it, stuff. It is uh, a whole different level of difficulty. I mean, armored plus P is hard because of all the equipment you have to uh, wear and, and get through every stage with, particularly the tight confines yep. sometimes. But classic is, you know, ultra nightmare difficulty it's mode. It's the hard, it is expert mode, it really is. And hats off to those people that have signed up for classic manual. Right. <laughs> It'll be fun. We only have one question for Armored Plus P, which I'm actually surprised because it's kind of the most complex of all of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, Robert B., I'm trying Armored Plus P this year. Looks like the rules have changed slightly. Can you clarify the changes? My understanding in the past we had to carry all ammo and supplies for the match. Well, in the past, or well, at least Desert Brutality before, Armored Plus P was kind of a weird convergence between Armored Plus P and Trooper, which is something you progenitated. Right. I'll get into that in a second. The rules for Armored Plus P this year were to bring it in line with what they use in Finland called TST. And TST is essentially the division that incorporates all the rules required for people in Finland that are that are reservists or active and the gear requirements that they would need for true field exercises. And w it, with the exception of that, we added a helmet, which they don't have in Finland's TST division. But because the brutality matches have now a long-standing and a growing tradition of having matches in Finland, we figured that making TST and Armored Plus P more the same made a lot of sense. Right, so rather than carrying all your ammo for the entire match, what you have to do is start each stage with four loaded primary magazines, two loaded secondary magazines, a med kit that has minimum requirements of a tourniquet, a trauma dressing, and a four-inch roll of gauze, a liter or a quart of water. We determine they're kind of interchangeable, yep. um, particularly in the U.S. And um, any maintenance equipment uh, or cleaning equipment that you use for the entire event. And you also need a fixed blade field knife that is at least four inches in length. So Rather than carrying, like, I think I started off like 300 rounds of rifle and 300 rounds of pistol each year. Now I'm just starting with four magazines on my person. That can be, you know, one of those mags can be in your gun if you're starting with a loaded gun start. Sure. But 
now you're just carrying those four loaded magazines, the two secondary magazines, and then all the ancillary equipment. So it's turning it into more of, like you said, a martial field exercise yep. type division. Fair enough. And so, and, that, and that's the goal. The whole, the whole purpose of this year's match, even classic, is like focused on a more martial element. Now, obviously, it's a match and it's fun and it's competitive, but we want to keep pushing that narrative forward to bring this back to what, what I personally believe, and I think you do too, competitive shooting should be able to offer to the environment. Right, it should be a, a fun thing to do, but when matches start losing martial relevance, they actually start uh, losing interest to a wider cross-section of the firearms community. You know, we consistently see in NSSF surveys, what's the main reason people purchase guns? Self-defense. Self-defense. Then hunting after that, probably. Yeah, and it's, it's always a primary, secondary purchasing decision for yep. firearms. So, unlike other purely competitive venues, we want to maintain the martial aspect of this match and keep it appealing to a broader cross-section of the gun community and perhaps people who are not being served by other competitive venues. And thus the reason the stage design is based around the idea of an iron-sided AK being viable. Because it is still a viable combat rifle. And if you take an iron-sided AK to a lot of three-gun events, just give up. You're going to get bodied. Just don't even bother. Yeah. Uh, classic manual, Dylan P. Will competitors in the manual division still have the same part-time as other divisions? Yes. So good luck. Christopher G. In regards to classic division handguns, particularly the pre-1946 designations, are later manufactured date firearms that are otherwise identical to their pre-46 design acceptable? Examples would be post-war P-38 P-1, modern 1911-1911 A-1, post-war T-33 but not the M-57, thank you for clarifying that, or like a Tassos High Power considering it has Novak sights. I would say for the most part, yes. Yeah, the, the caveat here is to look at the handgun addendum. So, like, if it has, like, fiber optic sights or other features like a light rail, uh, the, the P1 we've already specifically authorized because it's not an advantage in any Actually, way. Actually, it's a disadvantage. It's a harder gun to shoot than the right. P38. The, the 1911 versus 1911A1, as long as it has regular iron sights and no other, like, modern features, it'd be allowed. If you want clarification, again, email us, match coordinator at inrange.tv. Um, and then there was a couple others we had where it was a, a Soviet or Comblock imported handgun that had to have some sort of safety added to it. Oh, you're talking about a Tokarev. Yeah, and, and in those cases, because they were imported, um, they had to be imported that way, we've allowed it. So, yep. so uh, 1911 is a great example, right? You take a standard 1911A1 and you put on adjustable like match sights with a fiber optic front dot and a magwell funnel. No, that would not be acceptable. But a like a standard 1911 built the standard 1911 specs with standard iron sights, regardless if it was made in 1912 or, nine, or 2018, we don't care. Uh, and something I'll clarify for retro is people have asked this too about uh, tritium sights. Tritium sights did start being issued in the 80s to the best of my knowledge. And particularly if you have like burned out tritium sights, we don't care. If you have like modern regular three dot uh, tritium sights on your retro handgun, we don't care. It's not a competitive advantage in any way. No. So, Spencer M, as a classic manual combatant, I'm in decent shape and have functional weapon handling skills. How ready should I be to par every stage? I think if he shoots Ooh. clean, uh, the thing is not getting misses because every yeah. miss is in, is way more costly in classic than other divisions. Where and with anyone with a semi-auto can just hammer rounds out till they get the hit. So I think making uh, clean shots and not wasting shots, particularly with the reload times, is going to be the determination if you time out in classic or not. This is an interesting in which this is one of those interesting paradigms in which slow and clean is going to be better than going as racing fast as possible. Right. Take that extra 10%, let your sight stabilize and send it. If you try to hurry too much, it's going to cost you because the reload times on most of those guns are what's the, the biggest penalty is, right? For the most part, plus shot recovery, with, generally speaking, these are probably going to be like full bore guns, right? right? So yeah, make those shots count. And I, 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 think, I think it'll all be, if you're on your ball, you should be able to make it through without parring out. Um, but it's going to be hard. And as we said earlier, this is going to be the most difficult division. Classic is the hardest. Classic manual is the hardest of the hardest. So, but I, I really think it's going to be awesome. And uh, by the way, I'm in classic manual myself. So we'll see you there. James B. To clarify, I've watched your videos between you and Ian. And Bolt on the range have made the statement that bolt action rifles versus semi-autos. Have you seen folks take this as a challenge in matches in real life rather than petulant foot stomping on the internet? No. Um, for the most part... But for the most part, for the entire part, with the exception of just mentioning, we have, I think, seven or eight people in Classic Manual total out of essentially 200 shooters. 
So do the math. Um, that is well above average in general compared to the standard two gun match in which manual guns show up never. It'll be like one guy Maybe. out of 50. And it might be me. <laughs> right. Right. So, no, for the most part, what we hear from people is they want to rant and rave about how bolt guns are still wonderful things. By the way, they're fun. I'm not saying they're not fun. But when it comes to actually proving it on the field of competitive, on the competitive field of timed and dudes watching dudes, guess what? They don't show up. Rebuttals shall be posted in the form of heads-up match results only. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's get into this general gear. Bunny. I posted this on another Q&A solicitation, but we'll post it here because it's more specific to two-gun. Can you recommend a good pistol holster design for two-gun? Because I've heard Carl say normal competition holsters don't typically have enough retention. I'll give my answer, and I'd like to hear what you have to say. I always say the same thing over and over again. For the most part, because of what the way two-gun matches are designed and brutality matches being a derivative and larger version thereof, I'm a huge fan of the UM84, the standard US flap holster. It does an excellent job of retaining the gun as long as you've got it latched, the gun will not fall out. It will pretty much hold any standard service gun size-wise, and it's relatively good balance between speed of both draw and reholster on the clock. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, so if I'm competing slick without a bunch of extra load-bearing gear uh, beyond like a basic plate carrier. I like using the Weepley the second Chuckwalla mm -hmm. that I helped them come up with a fully protect and optic equipped pistol. For events like Desert Brutality I will add a bungee retention strap to that so that um, I'm consciously disengaging it as I'm moving into the pistol shooting area. It's worth that extra second versus having the pistol getting dumped out and DQ'd. And you can easily add a bungee retention to any Kydex holster yeah. by putting it through one of the eyelets um, and then kind of tying it around and making it so it's tight enough to hold it in place. And you can just buy those for any number of tactical gear companies that have them for M4 mag pouches as replacements. The one thing the UM84 does that Chuck Walla will not is if you're crawling through the dirt. Well, that's just kind of the cost of doing business with an optic equipped pistol. So, um, other than that, I also like using Safariland ALS holsters, yeah. um, the active locking system is very fast and offers great retention. The difficulty with Safari Lands is they are not available for every make and model of pistol, mm -hmm. and you know it, it may be very difficult to get one. They also have a very long lead time now because they're doing the holster contract for the new M17 that the Army adopted, and if you're getting a red dot equipped uh, pistol holster from them, it is going to take a very long time. I, t I got one, it took over four months. Wow. Um, because they have that long lead time, because all those are basically made custom. There's too, sure. many, too many combinations of things. So. Uh, if you do need a optic equipped pistol holster, we plead the second can get that done for you a lot quicker. Uh, just make sure you list in the comments on their site that it is for Desert Brutality, yeah. and they are one of our event sponsors for 2020 as well. They so. are. Let me back that up too. The Chuck Walla holsters is what I've been using for all of my red dot uh, mounted pistols. Mm -hmm. We plead, and it's it is fantastic. I, I, I tend to keep falling back into my classic mindset of like what fits a P38 and a 1911 and a Beretta. It's like, well, the UM84 does. But but I also have the weird in-range requirement of my pistol changes like not by day, but by the hour sometimes it matches. And the thing I'll say too is people coming from a traditional competitive background, yeah. your draw stroke time is not going to win or lose this match. No. It, no. It doesn't matter. Remember, brutality matches, we have a totally different system. This is not as much of a drag race as so many matches are penalties at this match are 60 seconds for penalty right oh that changes everything and if and that includes we do have some leeway this year where if your unloaded pistol falls out of the holster yeah it's not a dq but it is plus 60 seconds yep uh last year we had someone accrue three of those on one stage as they dropped their pistol multiple times out of their holster so make sure that your pistol has uh, adequate retention in the holster do some jumping jacks do some up downs do some burpees with it on your belt, unloaded. Make sure your gun's unloaded, as you were saying. The other thing you can do is stick it in your belt. Literally hold your belt upside down off you and shake the damn thing. Mm -hmm. If it falls out once, it's not right. Because this environment is one in which this, this pistol falling out thing is consistently a problem. Not only at brutality matches, but at two-gun. Like, it is it is the number one DQ cause at two-gun. And it's totally avoidable. Like, And this whole idea that that split second of getting your gun out of the holster is going to give you a difference in score in our environment is bullshit. It's not real. So it's much better to have something that retains and protects the gun. Alexander H. Aimpoint Acro, Delta Point Pro, or Trijicon RMR? You should go with this first. Um, well, I prefer the Delta Point Pro currently. I don't own an Aimpoint Acro yet. I have been unable to get one because they are back-ordered everywhere. Yep. 
as new products often are. So um, with what's readily available, I like the Delta Point Pro because it has held up for me over time from actual shooting. Um, I had a lot of Gen 1 RMRs that broke. Every time I was training up for a match, they broke. I understand the Gen 2s might be better, but I also prefer not having to remove the site to change out the battery. Um, I'm ready and willing to switch to the Acro as soon as I can get one. I already have a gun built with the slide milled, ready to accept it, but I don't think that'll be happening in time for Desert Brutality 2020. This is um, this is always controversial because it's like RMR has kind of become Kleenex. It's not tissue paper. Like everyone thinks RMR, RMR. Like they don't even know what they just that becomes the word. Um, and a lot of people are RMR fans and cool and good on you. And if that thing has worked well for you, have at it. Um, when we speak to our experience, we can only speak to our experience. My experience with the RMR was nothing but problems for me, failures, optics issues, battery issues. So I'm not a fan. The Delta Point did great. I have been able to get an Acro, which we have a video on the channel, and I can't speak to the battery life of the Acro yet, but what I can speak to this is I think the Acro is the right step forward. It's a tube, it's enclosed, it doesn't get dirt, it can't be obstructed by water or issues in terms of external environmental conditions, and on top of that, you don't even necessarily need the backup iron sights to do a handoff from the irons to the dot because it's a tube, it sort of aligns much better. So, personally, I think the Acro is the way to go. We kind of answered this already, but let's hit it again. Tim, why did you implement the new secondary equipment rules? Knife, water, med kit, etc. Well, part of it was to be aligned with TST, which is the armor division in Finland, but we also included it in Scout because we want this match to be more martially minded. Right, it's also in uh, Kalashnikov division yeah. as well, which is basically modern AKs um, in a uh, fighting context. So. I think adding the equipment uh, gives some people some additional concerns with how they're going to make it through some of the obstacles and managing their gear throughout the match um, versus just throwing the minimum on their person to complete a stage. Yep. And it's awesome. it's, it just provides a much more realistic, plausible environment, in my opinion. Donald W. Um, this one's going to be controversial, too. Why no rat tourniquets? All right, so in the med kit, we required for those divisions, we required a tourniquet to be there. And I, sp I added specifically not to include rats. And here's the reason I did that, without getting too deep into the weeds. Um, uh, this is going to encourage a lot of people in our audience to go buy a tourniquet. They may not have one. Which, by the way, if you're a shooter and you don't have a med kit, that's an oversight. So this is hopefully encouraging people to do the right thing. At the minimum, they're going to have on themselves a pressure bandage and a tourniquet, right? And so if we're going to encourage people to go buy a tourniquet, by the way, my advice is to go buy a cat. I think those are the standard that everyone should live and die by and hopefully not die because die they have a tourniquet. The Rats is a challenging product. Um, there are some concerns that I have around it in regards to nervous system damage or neurological tissue damage upon way applying it because of the surface area of the tourniquet and it is a challenging tourniquet to use successfully because while it might work well on like children or pets when it comes to someone of our size or our arms or legs um, getting that actual blood cut off with a rat's is a much more difficult thing to do than it is with like a cat. So there are lots of videos about rats versus cat and if we're going to encourage people to buy a tourniquet, I would rather encourage one that pretty much everyone universally agrees works great. Well, that's the interesting thing. Well, looking at people talk on the Discord, a lot of people specifically went out and bought med supplies yeah. because of the match. So, mission so, accomplished in that regard. Yeah, and so I would rather encourage one that there isn't controversy around and the cat isn't, right? There's others too, but there you go. Andrew K. In past videos, you've stated that all that slide-mounted red dots are the future. When do you believe that competition divisions will start to reflect this impending ubiquity and allow them in classes other than armored, open, or carry optics? I don't think it needs to be in other divisions. Um, I mean, three guns added stealth division where as long as it fits in the box um, with its sighting systems and magazines, it's allowed. I think that's a step in the right direction because it's giving you a size constraint for a service pistol to work with all these accessories. But I think there's always a place for iron sight and um, otherwise limited equipment. There's yep. also a place for using a optic in combination with an iron sight pistol because not everyone's going to switch to this. Uh, at some point in the future they might, but I think that's a bit further off. Um, grouping people together with like equipment is the purpose of equipment divisions, and if everyone has a red dot on their pistol, there'd be no reason to have different divisions. And I, in, in, in a brutality match environment, armored is our closest thing to open, and it's also pushing things in the direction of what a modern soldier or would be using in the field and so do modern soldiers currently have red dot pistols for the most part no but 
that will change and what we're doing there is hopefully reflecting that. And it's also a trade-off. You're, you're getting the most advanced equipment at the cost of additional weight. Yep, totally. Uh, all right, so these ones are more about Patreon and registration, which we had an interesting situation go on with that. It was, um, so we'll get there. So Stephen A., with Desert 2020, Desert Brutality 2020 full with patrons, what's the likelihood for a waitlisted individual to be able to compete? You can answer more of this or not, and I'm very thankful. Like, fagan has been doing a lot of the administrative back end, but so to those that don't know, um, when the match, so what we did is we have a, we have a perk on Patreon for InRange called Two Gun Army, and we provided the registration for both Classic, Retro, AK, and then Scout and Armored early to them, a couple weeks early, at a discounted rate because these are people that are dedicated supporters of InRange and the product project in general. And Armored and Scout filled up completely out of Two Gun Army. Classic Retro got pretty full. Then we eventually, a couple weeks after that, dumped it, dropped it down to full price but all Patreon so they got early enrollment because these, these are people that support InRange and the project. And then Classic Retro almost filled. We had, I think, 13 seats left when we went to public Anyone could, act, could access it. And so out of that, so people that were not Patreon supporters, there were 13 seats left, and they were for Classic, Retro, and AK. And the reason we did that is straight up, these people keep in range alive, they keep the Desert Brutality matches alive because of their willingness to support the project. So they should be deserve. These are the core supporters of the, of the goals and of the, the video channel and of the matches, so they should have first enrollment. So in that regard, we do have wait lists running. What's the likelihood? It depends on where you're at in the uh, queue. So your shooter number, I don't know if practice score actually emails that to you when you register. That would be the number that you are like beyond 90 on the wait list. So yeah. like we, we have 90 slots registered in both. We're reserving 10 slots for sponsors and other uh, people like that and potential staff that uh, as we get closer to the match and those don't fill, we will then allow those remaining slots that we're holding currently to be filled with people on the wait list. So there's a potential for 10 more people in each match to get into those slots. Now, if you're number 40 on the wait list, you're probably not getting in because that would require half the match to cancel. Well, there's other people that may cancel. Like, we unfortunately, we heard about one of the participants had a car accident and couldn't be at the match. So that opens up a slot. Right. Yeah. So, like, as those happen... The next person in line will receive notification that they're next in line and they have 48 hours to pay mm. and get into the match. So it, it really just depends on where you're at on the waiting list. Um, but if you're, I'd say, over 15 slots, mm. it is unlikely that you will actually get into the match. Probably not. And we also had a lower cancellation rate this year because mm. of the way we did it where it was open to patrons first because they're dedicated. In 2019 for the match, we had quite a few cancellations and refunds because anyone who could just sign up for the match as soon as it went live, and then maybe they were some other sort of competitive shooter discipline where it turned out it wasn't really what they wanted or they had other commitments or sure. whatever. So making it open to the patrons first made sure that those slots that were taken were for truly dedicated people that are going to be there. You touched on something important, which I don't know that everyone realizes. What, what's the cutoff date where you can't drop out and get refunded? Uh, December 31st, I believe, is what we have listed. Yeah. So we will still refund you if your slot fills, but the problem is when you get like a week from the match and there's 40 people waiting, yeah. then it doesn't help the people who are waiting because they can't take time off work, they can't schedule flights, yep. they can't do all that kind of stuff. So after December 31st, if you cancel, you only get a refund if your slot fills and is paid for. Keep in mind that running matches like this is a high-risk endeavor in terms of financially speaking so if someone sits on a slot and they like register the day it opens up and then they cancel the day before the match they are cutting into the ability for us to make sure that we're able to run the event properly so we have to have a date where we can't refund you unless someone takes the slot well and, and ethically if you think you're probably not going to make it cancel sooner rather than later because you're keeping someone else from attending well yeah, and don't take someone's fun away from them right if someone else can show up and, and enjoy the match and you can't then that'd be that'd be the kind thing to do right um, Travis W. Being a Patreon subscriber, I plan to bring my brother, who was not a Patreon subscriber, out to shoot this. I really wanted to show him how fun it was. Unfortunately, he filled up so fast, and I understand that I won't be able to get him out there to this particular event as a competitor. My question is, will there be changes in the future that will accommodate for non-Patreon subscribers to make it to future events? No. Probably not. Um, no. in fact, I think we're going to make it a little tighter. But... Yeah, we're going to implement some logistical changes for the next Brutality event where there will be unique registration codes emailed out to all the Two-Gun Army patrons. And it's up to you to determine how far out yeah. we do that versus the, the bulk of the match. 
But what I see this hap happening with this event is that it's evolving into the in-range patron annual meeting and gathering and match. Well, I, it, that wasn't its goal, but it's kind of becoming it's, that. It's becoming that, and I think it makes sense for the people who are actively supporting to have priority access. Now, if we can get this match in the future to have venues where we can be even bigger and we can have more competitors, eventually if we can... That would be probably the best answer. So in regards to getting early enrollment and making sure you're getting a seat, no, that has to be Patreon because... It, or, or I should say direct supporters for InRange because the reality is, as you know, being a supporter, InRange is only funded by you, you guys. We, we're not monetized. We're not sponsored. So that, that direct support from the viewer is critical to keeping InRange alive and keeping these matches alive. So that's why there needs to be perks for those people. If we're able in the future to have a larger, like this year we have essentially 200 competitors. Let's say something happens next match and we can have 400 then there's a good chance that it's probably not going to fill up with all patrons because then it's going to have a larger number of seats open once it's filled right or once we have satisfied the people that are part of the supporters to get their seat now there's always going to be discounts and early enrollment for patreon supporters but if we have a larger volume or larger match that might make it more viable so maybe there's that and it really is clear this time that if we had the space available to be able to host 400 people we could have filled it we could have done it yep so this is a limitation of just facility and, and, and administrative things. Now, uh, Travis, other thing I want to add to this is that we are, uh, you, you've worked on this more than I have, but people can, family can bring family member to come watch. Right, that's, that's no additional charge. You don't have to pay the forward observer fee. Each competitor is allowed to bring one guest with them because that's pretty much a standard match practice where yep. people will bring their, their wife, their girlfriend, or maybe one of their kids with them to watch and uh, take photos and help support them during the event. So... Uh, if you are a registered competitor, you do not need to pay to have that person register. Bring your brother with, and he'll probably still have a great time because it's going to be a fun environment regardless and be able to watch it. Um, on that note, we do have a division called Forward Observer, and there are some people that want to literally just come watch the match, and that does have a fee associated with it if they're not associated with another shooter. And the reason for that is the facility doesn't make it viable for us to turn this into a 300-spectator event. So... Um, if you want to come watch and you're not going to shoot and you're not associated with one of the shooters in the match, sign up for the Forward Observer um, slot, which is on practice score, and that does come with some swag as well, which is right. really cool. Nick N., why did the armored spots go so fast? Well, I would say the scout went faster than armored, but why did they go so fast? I think he's just parsing that together. Yeah. Plus the modern equipment, it's what everyone owns, so mm -hmm. it's easy for people to sign up for it and understand what they needed to do. I think so too. Where, uh, right now, even though retro and classic are full... We're getting questions daily about what equipment is legal for it as people acquire things to compete in those divisions. So I think it was just an easier call for people to just jump into Scout and Armored and shoot it with what they got. I agree. Spectators. Jacob B., what's the word on spectators for the event? I guess I just answered that, Jacob. Um, if you're not associated with a shooter and you're not their guest to come watch, then there is the Ford Observer Division, which you can sign up for, and then you can watch all four days of the match. Match design. Tom B. Any chance of seeing team stages similar to Tiger Valley at any other Brutality or 2G ECM matches? Funny, there actually was a team-based 2G ECM match, yep. what, a month ago? Two yeah. months ago? Um, so, yes, at Desert Brutality, I don't know yet. Um, I think it would have to be its own dedicated event. There might be team Brutality someday. Like, we're trying to expand this stuff. So, the goal is to have more of these matches per year and maybe do diverse things like that. So, is it possible? Yes. Craig S., what motivated you guys to develop more physical matches over USPSA, IDPA, and the norm? Well, I think that's simple for me. Um, I've been running the two-gun thing for, I don't remember now, a decade and a half. And um, what motivated me to do that, actually, Target Valley was a motivator. Um, the way we shot that and that whole venue was like, wow, this is eye-opening. But um, the, my rationale and my reasoning for it is I find the martial application of skills and weapons and gear in a competitive environment more interesting and more compelling than what you see in more traditional, now situated shooting competitions and disciplines. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with USPSA or IDPA, but I think adding physicality and being gassed and tired and worn up and beat and cut, trying to get your last shot off before the timer goes off, is a more interesting thing to me. Well, I mean, for me, one of the main reasons I got into competitive shooting in 2001 was to gain better understanding of how the products I was making and selling worked and, un and have an intelligent way to talk about their use. Yep. And having a more uh, dynamic environment to do that in is more interesting than just hosing paper at 5 to 10 yards. Which is not our thing. So, 
Scott H, would you ever force consider would you ever consider forcing reloads to be done behind cover? Interesting you say this because when what became two gun action challenge match started that was in the rule set and it be, it is I'm going to tell you we tried it. We've tried to force this so hard. It's freaking impossible. It is not something that is considered it is not something that's consistently applicable and measurable. So when you say in the rules, shooter must reload behind cover and there's a barricade there. What's cover? How much is cover? If their foot's exposed, is that cover? How do you do that? Do you put start boxes that they have to reload from? But then what happens when they have to reload because they run dry running between position A and B? It doesn't work. It cannot be applied in this environment. And the RO is very rarely seeing the person from the same perspective as whatever downrange would be seeing them. So it is interesting to note that after 20 years of existence, IDPA even went to fault lines. They gave up. Yeah, it was, it was too hard to enforce, and it was always a... Uh, issue of contention where ROs might be calling uh, foot fault or cover faults on people that just because they didn't like them or they may even be competing against them in yeah. some way. So it's much cleaner to just not have it. Do that in training environments. And I know that we blend training and martial environments in our match, but it's just not viable in the, under the clock. Eric L., would you ever consider a plainclothes division for two-gun using only a holster? I would never consider it. I don't think that we might People do People are already doing it. Just do it. If that's what you want to do, just do it. Like, come to the match. Do it. You can't do that in armored plus P, obviously. But, like, if you were in retro, you could pretty you could much do that. You could plainclothes retro all day long. Yeah, and a, a two-gun action challenge match or even the other local two-gun matches, at least once a year I will shoot using my carry gear with my shirt untucked, with my trunk rifle, and... Um, you won't see me wearing any mag pouch. I'll just throw an extra AR mag in my pocket. Yeah, and you could act, you, if you work smart. If you were if you're clever, you could get away with it in, in scout too. Yeah, you could you could probably do one of those ankle med kits. You could mm -hmm. probably stuff enough mags in your pockets mm -hmm. and just run. Um, Stick a knife on a belt. Yeah, which is not that big a deal here in Arizona. So like, I think you could do it. So there's no reason you don't couldn't if you wanted to. If that's something you're interested in, do it. But there's not going to be a division for it. And if there was a division, there'd be you and like two other people in it. Just to be honest. Tyler D. Do you feel that your preference for two-gun over three-gun is due to dislike of the three-gun combination or more the martial aspects or something else? For me, it's the martial aspects. Now, what's funny about this is when you say two-gun, it's everyone thinks we'll mitt shotgun. Well, at Desert Brutality, we are. But in reality, we've had shotgun-based events yet in Tucson as well where it's shotgun and pistol. I think when you try to jam all three guns together, it becomes artificial and weird. But I think what's more important about what we call two-gun on in-range is that it has those martial elements. Just merely omitting the shotgun is not the same thing. I think shotgun stages and three-gun are okay when I can basically shoot the gun empty and throw it down and switch to something else. Um, doing a few rounds of reloading is okay. Uh, I've had a lot of fun shooting shotguns in the past, mm -hmm. but I've been at this 19 years, and at this point shooting two-gun is just so much easier, and all the local three-gun matches have switched to allowing two-gun divisions within them. And my bag to go to a... A match shooting two gun is like literally just a shoulder bag with some extra loose rounds in it. Where if I go shoot three gun, I got to bring a ruck and I got to have all my shell caddies or my magazines for my mag fed shotgun and three different types of ammo. It increases the amount of stuff I got to worry about hauling around by over 100%. So um, it's for me, it's a lack of convenience and also that all the shotgun stages kind of evolved into reloading races more than uh, technical shooting. Now, when there's, yeah, yeah. when there's launched aerial clays and unique things like that, it's fun. It's kind of cool. That's what a shotgun's for is knocking yeah. birds out of the air. Mostly. Yeah, so um, I enjoy those kind of stages. I enjoy those kinds of trick targets. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when you combine all three into one stage, it feels artificial and contrived. I will say this. Out of all the competitive shooting I've done where I had the most fun shooting a shotgun in competition, it wasn't any of these things. It was cowboy action shooting. Shotgun and cowboy is really fun. Miscellany. Paul S., what is the contingency plan for a winter storm closing the roads to the range and making the event delayed or canceled? Well, we have looked at the, demogra the demographics. We've looked at the statistics for years of the, of the weather in this environment. We've spoken to the gentleman who runs the range, and we've looked at the roads in the environment. It is possible there'll be a storm. It is possible there'll be snow. It is possible it'll be cold. And in that regard, shooters should be prepared to bring cold weather gear with them. However... Statistically speaking, looking at where the range is, its altitude, and the weather over the last, like, decade, that ain't going to happen. Yeah, I think the most snow they've gotten is uh, four inches in one month Correct. during that time frame. And the people who run the range have told us that the town does get snow plowed if that happens. And 
we will have access to the range. Now, the range might be full of snow, but guess what? We're still shooting. Yeah, we shoot no matter what. If we can get to the range and if there's not a just inherent safety issue, we are shooting. So if it snows and we get to shoot in Desert Brutality Snow Winter Wonderland, rad. But the average daytime temperature that time of year is in the 50s. Yep. And the average nighttime temperature is in the 20s. Bring cold weather gear. Jeff K., do we need ROs or are those slots filled? Pretty much have all the RO stuff covered. Um, we recruited a number of local guys that shoot two-gun action challenge match with us and some of the other locals that do uh, two-gun and three-gun at uh, Rio Salado. So as of now, we are covered on ROs. Okudo, are there any guns you'd like to see people bring or think would be interesting to see used? Oh, well, that goes, I mean, that could go endless for me. Um... Uh, I would like to see more classic stuff. I think that's really cool. I think that it's going to be really compelling to see what people are doing with manual. I think manual is really, I don't know what's going to happen there. I would love to see some real select fire stuff out on the range. As I'm hearing it, there might be one, if not two, MP44s out there. That's really cool. Um, man, I don't know. Is there anything that particularly tickles you in that regard? It'd be cool to see someone try to run a belt fed. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously we're, we've a, Granted some exemptions to people that were talking about it over the, the 30 round capacity limit mm. in uh, classic or retro if they had an actual belt fed because yeah. running around with a 20 to 25 pound gun and, and keep in mind we have a lot of clearing and, and empty gun starts. We do. Uh, I don't think it would be any kind of advantage but it would certainly be fun to watch. Now it would be really interesting and I heard about this going on in Ukraine where people were taking PKMs and they were breaking the belts apart to 20 round lengths. Mm -hmm. Like man if you had like a whole bag of like 20 round lengths and you're just like... And then, yeah, belt feds would be sweet. Uh, Clark L. Can we expect a socialized prize table similar to DB 2019? I understand why you're using the word, but what we do with that, what we did last year, is prizes were not based on score. They were based on random number generators. So if you were a competitor, you had everyone had an equal chance to the prize table. Right. And this year, um, based on surveying the people on Discord and, and some other places, we found that most people didn't really care about having prizes. Mm -hmm. They wanted to have some cool stuff available. So we're working on some cool swag for the match, including yep. patches, uh, shirts, and a poster that all the competitors will get. And I think everyone people, gets that. People will really enjoy it. So, but there will be prizes donated by sponsors as well. Um, some of them are doing some unique things for the event uh, in particular. But we don't want to give that away until the event. What I do want to say is, for the most part, the prize table will be quote unquote socialized, but there might be a few prizes that are not. Probably the way to put it. Jeff, are there any divisions that seem undeservedly less populated? And if so, would the brutality matches benefit from incentivizing, via score, equipment, or time, shooters to choose them? Well, I've already said this. In my opinion, the classic division, considering what InRange is about and the audience that InRange has, I was surprised to see Classic be, uh, not minimal, but as small as it was compared to the others. So, would I incentivize it? No. Um, I don't see a reason to do that. Either people want to do it or they don't. What I would say is that if you think your bolt action can compete with a semi-auto, this is the environment for you to prove me wrong. This would be interesting just as a showcase thing, but have like five guys with Mosins shoot a stage all at once, like on the <laughs> line doing like World War One like squad <laughs> tactics. And bring a mallet for when they jam. Right, yeah. right. But it's not feasible to run as part of a match, but no. it'd be fun to run as like a an exhibition thing. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> training questions. Eki T. How useful is a twenty two for match training purposes? I will tell you that I have not used twenty two for match training dynamic shooting like two gun. I have used twenty twos for training for um, my marksmanship based disciplines, which was NRA high power across the course national matches and shooting a twenty two. Um, on a very tiny black target in a, in a sling and a jacket um, at 100 yards is an incredibly mind-taxing, difficult marksmanship drill. And I would say that for marksmanship, 22 was very effective and useful. I've never tried to bother with dynamic shooting. Have you tried to use 22 for like practice for this kind of stuff? Um, the problem with using 22 for action shooting is reliability. It'll and work. Yeah, and when I've done 22 matches, action matches, it always came down to whose gun just worked the whole time. They lucked out, or they spent the most money on the, the highest quality ammunition. Now, for training purposes, I think you're just as effective with a gas-powered airsoft gun mm -hmm. as using 22 at this point. Probably. And I've done some uh, youth training using 
uh, airsoft guns for that purpose. Now I wouldn't use like one of the electronic gearbox yeah, ones because they have a, they have a, they have a, they have a yeah. wind up and it's not effective. But if you're using a gas powered one, pistol or rifle, I think that is as effective within 20 yards for action shooting training. Fair. Connor D, what is the best way for someone limited to a static, uh, no movement allowed range to train for DB? Well, I assume you're saying range. Well, you're saying range, so we have to assume you mean gunfire. I was going to say that for someone to train without a range would be just getting in and out of prone as fast as possible. <laughs> that would really be a huge benefit. On, yeah. a, on a range, though, what I would say is um, single shot target transitions. Yeah, you could set up, uh, you know, different uh, targets that have like the different bullseyes on them, and just practice switching between, you know, one, two, three, and pop, 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 pop. Right. Um, and offhand shooting. Uh, wow. If you can shoot well offhand, you can pretty much shoot well supported. So I agree with that. Um, a lot of what you can do to practice for these events is at home dry. Um, set up some of your furniture and practice acquiring your sights around it with an unloaded gun, obviously, uh, from different angles. Um, like Carl said, getting into and out of prone, getting into and out of kneeling, um, and all that kind of stuff. Moose Mamer. Nice name. <laughs> I'm supposed to kill the moose, not maim it. <laughs> what do you do, follow it up and finish it off with a knife in the back of the head? Um, what would you consider to be the bar for entry to a desert brutality event, as in what should someone be capable of in terms of shooting ability and athleticism? I would actually say neither of those two are very important beyond understanding the safety protocols and rules for range. Right. Uh, for a match in particular, what it's like to move with a gun on safe, finger off trigger, run with them, maintain the 180 muzzle discipline, all that stuff matters more than shooting ability or athleticism to make it through a match because the match is a very dynamic, a lot of movement, and being cognizant of all that stuff and not getting ahead of yourself matters more than either of those two. Right, and what you should do before attending one of these events is find your local pistol steel match mm -hmm. and go shoot that. Any match. Get any match under yeah. your belt so you understand just how matches work. I just bring up those because like most places around the country have like some sort of like weekly pistol indoor match or outdoor match and it'll get you familiar with the match environment and moving safely with a gun to me that's the bar of entry when it comes to shooting ability and athleticism that's entirely based on your individual goals for what you expect to get out of the match like if you want to win then there's definitely a bar because it's definitely a, a matrix of both of those things combined if you're there for self and if you're there for fun and you par out on six stages but you had a good time you've achieved your goal if you show up and it's there for self-improvement and you par out of three of them and finish the other three, but to you that was better than last year, then you've met your goal. I don't think there should be a bar set in that regard. The only bar that should be set is that you're safe and you don't get disqualified. But maybe what we could talk about is like general concepts of what people will do physically. Sure. Like be able to run 300 yards total. Yeah, more and more maybe. Yeah. Being able to carry something heavy safely. Yeah. Something up to 100 pounds safely, Probably. typically. Yeah. Um, kettlebell swings. Kettlebell swings. Um, being able to uh, do, what, maybe 15 to 20 burpees. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, I agree with all that. Um, Suicide just, sprints are more important than duration runs. Yeah. Being able to run a short duration of time as fast as possible versus long matters more than anything. Now, and what you can do is if you have an elliptical or a treadmill at home is you can do those bursts. Mm -hmm. On that, and then get off and dry fire for 10 seconds. Yeah, you could do that. So. I agree. And let's not maim any more moose. Or is it meese? Meeses? <laughs> try try give T-R-Y-G-V-E. What do you think is a safe minimum when it comes to gear, weapon, platforms, formal instruction, experience before attending a two-gun match? I think we already said this. Yeah. Uh, understand safeties. Don't go ahead of your abilities. And attend, at least go to one or two local matches to understand how matches work. Yeah, the, the main thing I see people run into safety issues with is when they are pushing speed beyond their skill level allowing. Yeah, that is where it is. That's absolutely it. Uh, okay, so here, now we're getting into the last bit. Fun, yeah. weird, and personal. Tristan P. In the future, when handheld rail guns or energy weapons are a thing, how will you accommodate at matches? We will have a division. We'll have energy weapon division. Right. And we'll just make sure you don't melt our targets. Yeah. And setting paper on fire is a plus. Yeah, and it'll probably be incorporated with wearing an exoskeleton. Probably. Oh, yeah. That'll come before rail guns or energy guns. So, yeah, we have them for sure. Uh, Jose H. Do either, do either of you have injuries at your age that complicate or hinder your match performance? Yeah, I've got my share, actually. 
Yeah, and I've I've started accumulating them over the past few years too, and and still managed to win a lot of matches, even with them. The the irony to me is about 15 years ago, one of my friends, Sterling White, who's older than me at, at a three gun match, said, "About the time you figure out how to shoot, your body's going to start giving you trouble." <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, that's where I'm at. Like yeah. when, right when I started like winning almost every local event I went to is when I started having like you know different like tendon or repetitive stress. That's how the great things. magnet works, man. It's like so. you're like, oh, things are going well. The great magnet will be like, nah. My right knee is a jacked up mess. I yeah. injured it many years ago, and it continues to hurt me every day, every everywhere I move and walk and do everything. So I, I had a partially torn hamstring in 2017 that didn't really become an issue until 2018, and I've done. A lot of physical therapy working through that, and it's pretty much back to normal, but I get need a tune-up every once in a while. Yep. The latest thing I'm dealing with is repetitive stress injury from pushing out with pistol and tendon issues related to my sure. forearm and elbow. And the only way you can really deal with that is, like, stop using it. Yep. So there's a, there's a trade-off there of, like, how much less practice and training am I going to do versus allowing it to recover. So... so. My right knee is thrashed. That's one thing. The other thing is um, many, many years of information security career. Literally, you want to talk about a job that's damaging your health? Sit at a desk and push code around all day long or network diagrams. It, my flexibility is less than optimal, and that is definitely a challenge for me. All right. Alan, in a bizarro, okay, a bizarro version of you falls out of a time warp armed with a G11, an AN94, and any of the Project Spew salvo guns. Do you know what all those are? Some of them. Okay. By, by how much of all, if at all, does that person outperform you using a modern AR-15 carbine with modern optics at Desert Brutality? Uh, G11, okay, first of all, the Spew salvo won't outperform you at all. Those things... We know there's problems with ammunition, accuracy, and consistency. So spew salvo is out the window. G11, caseless ammunition that breaks. How much energy does that deliver? Let's say, it's, let's it's, assume it works perfectly. I don't know the exact numbers, but it's probably going to be a problem on something like a spinner target. Right, so it's not going to deliver as much energy. No. I think and, the, and the full auto function isn't going to help with anything. No, and then if it does have a malfunction, man, you're just done. The AN-94 is the most likely one that would be competitive because of its extremely high rate of fire on burst. Maybe you, as you're going on the spinner, as one example, you could get two hits real quick. Like, it fires so fast that that, that single aim mm -hmm. allows you to get those doubles on that thing really well. I still think the AR-15 is going to bank all of them. Yeah, I, it would ultimately come down to um, familiarity with the equipment and, and how fit that alternate universe version of me is. Yeah, what I see in this argument, though, is that does an AR-15 with modern optics, are they? Be is it bettered by a G11, AN-94, or a salvo gun? And I'm going to say I don't think it is. No, the ARs had so many more decades of development. All the optics out there today are optimized to go on it. Yep. Um, I don't think any of those would be an advantage. And this is the last question. You ready for this one? Mm -hmm. Fred R., will the Emperor protect me during this match? Uh, the Emperor looks after all of his loyal servants. I know we have a number of people that are cosplaying at this event. Mm -hmm. And um, we have some Imperial Guardsmen and at least one uh, Adeptus Mechanicus Skatari showing up. So the Emperor does protect. Praise the Omnissiah. Oh, he's not talking about Trump? No. Oh, because Trump won't. <laughs> all right, guys, that's it. These questions are all provided by Patreon supporters. It's people like that that allow us to be able to do the kind of stuff we do. And all these people are, I believe, attending the Desert Brutality match, and we're really excited for this coming up. It's going to be awesome. I want to thank Sinister Rifleman Russell Fagan for being such a huge component of, of making this come together and for helping answer these questions today and bringing a different, another part of the mindset into what the Brutality matches can and should be. Guys, thank you for tuning into this. If you're not a Patreon supporter, please consider it, and that'll get you early entry into the next match that's coming up, as well as things like this Q&A. If you can't, I understand. Uh, just subscribe to one of the channels. You can find them all at inrange.tv. Share with your friends. Thanks a lot.